So, uh, welcome to the, the session on the technical track of the Qt World Summit. Um, we were talking about, or uh, my coworker Jack uh, from the USA, he is uh, heavily involved in the development of the Cubes build system. He will present to you the state of the union of the Cubes build system. Please welcome our speaker, Jake Petrolis. Thank you, Tobias. So before we begin, I just want to note that I gave a similar talk about cubes last year at Cube World Summit 2016 in San Francisco called Cubes, the Next Generation of Build Automation. Um, today I'm going to reiterate some of the content from that talk since cubes is still likely to be quite new to many of you. But because we have a lot more time today than we did the last talk, I'm going to go into a lot more detail about how cubes works, uh, cover some of the powerful new features we've added in the cube past three releases since last year, and go over some examples. Uh, I also have a lot more content, so I may try to go through this a bit quickly and talk a little bit fast in order to save some time at the end for questions. And I'll also talk about uh, the future roadmap of Qt and how Cubes fits into that. So with that, welcome to Cubes, Build System State of the Union, and let's begin. So what is Cubes? Uh, Cubes is a new build tool developed by the Qt project, which started as a research project at Nokia back in 2010 when they were the proprietors of Qt. Uh, just a little note regarding the pronunciation. Uh, the official pronunciation is CUBES. It is not QBS. CUBES is not an acronym, and it doesn't stand for anything. Uh, you might see a few references on the web to uh, Cute Build Suite or Cute Build System. Uh, there's even a very old one that said uh, Cute Build Salvation. But all of these are wrong. Don't listen to them. <laughs> if you see them, correct it. Uh, and part of the reason for this is because we don't want to give the impression that Cubes is a build tool only for Qt projects either. We want Cubes to be free to go beyond Qt and support other toolkits and other functionality as well. So Cubes has a very modular design, and unlike the other two build systems that are relevant for our ecosystem, QMake and CMake, uh, it doesn't generate or rely on make files in any way. Instead, it generates a build graph from a high-level project description, like both QMake and CMake do, but it also undertakes the task of executing the commands in the low-level build graph, replacing the role of make or ninja. We intend for Cubes to completely replace QMake in the Qt ecosystem, as well as serve as healthy competition to CMake, uh, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a moment. Uh, there's ongoing work to port the Qt build system from QMake to Cubes, and we hope to complete that within the next few Qt releases and fully transition with the release of Qt 6 and possibly earlier if time permits. Uh, that said, I want to stress that our plans for Cubes do not preclude the use of other build systems for Qt-based projects. We will continue to provide CMake modules for Qt and will also continue to keep compatibility for QMake-based projects for the time being, although Cubes will eventually become our default and preferred and recommended build tool. It's important to us that our users have choice and we don't want to take that away from you. And one thing that sets Cubes apart from many other build tools is that it avoids introducing a new domain-specific language that you have to learn and understand. Instead, the Cubes language is simply QML, except instead of visual items like item and rectangle and window, you have items that are specific to build systems like module, rule, and artifact. You also have the power of JavaScript at your fingertips, which is absolutely indispensable when writing complex rules and other build processes, something that can be quite verbose and challenging with other build tools, especially QMake and CMake. And of course, like Qt, Cubes is open source under the LGPL and is platform independent. Uh, it's also language and toolkit independent, meaning that it has support for additional languages beyond, Q beyond uh, C++ and isn't inherently tied to Qt in any way, like QMake is. We know there are some people that happen to use QMake for plain C++ projects, but it's not a very common use case because it isn't very well suited for that. So why are we building a new build tool? This is a question that comes up again and again, and I want to try and put some of these questions to rest. So first, as a company, Qt is not only in the business of providing a cross-platform application development framework, but we also aim to provide amazing developer experiences. Our CTO and chief maintainer, Lars Knoll, recently gave a presentation at CppCon in Seattle a couple of weeks ago, where he talked about the history of the company and that our founders had a goal to, quote, make software development fun and easy. And we believe that philosophy should extend to build tools as well. And just like that was missing for graphical toolkits at the time, it's missing for build tools today. I'm not sure that any of you would claim with a straight face that CMake is fun or easy, even those of you who are fans of it. <laughs> uh, next, I'd like to reiterate some of the reasons I mentioned last year, but in more detail. 
I mentioned that both QMake and other existing build tools like CMake are not meeting our needs. Why is this? To begin with, QMake is now widely considered unmaintainable, including by its own maintainer. There are probably between one and three people in the world who actually understand QMake well enough to make major changes to it. I think all of them are in this building, and uh, at least two of them are in this room. <laughs> Uh, its legacy has resulted in a code base that has very little semblance of formal design. Uh, it's extremely fragile. It doesn't have very good backwards or forwards compatibility. The documentation is very poor and incomplete. And it has extremely tight coupling to Qt and Qt's release cycle, most importantly. Its support for modern platforms like iOS and Android is a complex set of indirections that ties together multiple build systems and makes it extraordinarily difficult to understand, extend, and maintain. And sometimes starting over with a fresh set of ideas is the best way to go. It's not always, but sometimes it is. A lot has changed in the past 15 to 20 years. Platforms are different, and real-world projects have new needs. The old days where compiling and linking C++ code was pretty much the only uh, feature that was required of a build tool is long gone. We need a new tool for the modern age, something that was designed with modern platforms and projects in mind, with all of their strange situations and special cases taken into account, rather than bolted onto a design that was never intended to accommodate them. Though CMake is in many ways uh, in better shape than QMake, uh, especially in terms of documentation for one, it's still based on exactly the same fundamental design principles and has the same fundamental architectural limitations that QMake does, not to mention the same uh, problems with its implementation, uh, especially for modern platforms like iOS and Android. And later on in the talk, I'll go through some examples of these, what these architectural issues are and what sort of advanced platform features Cube supports or is aiming to support that QMake and CMake don't attempt to. Uh, perhaps one of the most critical motivations is that we want to enable lightning-fast incremental builds to shorten the edit-compile-debug cycle, which is something makefile generators like QMake and CMake are notoriously bad at due to the inherent limitations of recursive makefiles. Lastly, for the business folks if the in the audience, if there are any of you, the lower complexity of cubes and its greater ease of use means reduced costs. Imagine if cubes saves your engineers 30% of their time on build-related tasks. That could easily be a cost savings in tens of thousands per year, depending on the size of your team. Uh, maybe it's even in the millions, depending on your currency's exchange rate. Uh, so. Let's talk about the, a bit about the cube's language and its advantages. So <clears throat> I mentioned that it's based on QML and JavaScript, and it's therefore both familiar and very powerful, uh, especially familiar to those of you in the Qt ecosystem, which you know, all of you here today are. This is an area where most build tools are sorely lacking. CMake is notorious for its language, and you know, someone like Tobias could tell you how difficult it is to parse. And it's widely considered ugly, overly verbose, and developers trying to integrate it with other tools usually have a very hard time because of this. And QMake largely suffers from the same problems. Uh, regarding the competition, so starting with CMake, it has an arcane language. It has lots of hard-coded Qt and C++, C++ specific assumptions that make it exceedingly difficult to achieve anything custom. It has evolved over the years as a series of hacks layered upon another, making it very difficult to maintain and understand. And one consequence of that is there's lots of bugs that we'll probably never find and probably never fix. Not because we want to, but just because the architecture makes it that much more difficult. And CMake's language is even worse, at least in my opinion. It's a formally declarative language, but has bolted on imperative concepts and it's commonly viewed as very strange and arcane, even among CMake experts. Writing simple projects seems to require more effort uh, than with CMake, and complex projects are you know, regarded as always possible, but they're usually written in a cargo cult fashion. So you need to solve you know, some problem X, Y, Z, search the web for that, copy the solution, cross your fingers that it works, and that you don't have to understand how it works. So let's go through a basic overview of the cube's language, what it looks like, how it works. The cube's language grammar, again, is simply QML, and all of its functionality is built from a limited set of primitives. 
Officially, it's actually a dialect of QML, but uh, the only difference in the grammar currently is that imports aren't required to specify a version number. I'm pretty sure that's the only difference. Uh, Christian in the back could tell you for sure. Um, the most fundamental units of interaction in cubes are modules, rules, and artifacts. And there's a few more, which I'll talk about later. So a cube's project can contain one or more modules, which in turn may contain one or more rules, each of which may produce any number of artifacts. You'll note that the concept of rules and artifacts is pretty common among all build tools, and obviously GNU Make has them as well. And starting with artifacts, which are probably the most uh, important primitive in cubes, uh, an artifact represents either an input or output file in the build system. Uh, for example, an input file is like a C or C++ source code file, and an output, fi and a, um, an output file is like a compiled object file, an application, or some other artifact, like maybe an installer. And artifacts are classified into different types using file tags, a concept which is kind of similar to MIME types. And many of these tags are automatically applied based on the file's extension, but can also be manually set or overridden if needed. Rules consume input artifacts, uh, conforming to a particular set of file tags declared by that rule, and then produce one or more artifacts as a result of processing those inputs. Again, very standard among build systems. An example of a rule would be the C++ compiler, which consumes C++ source files as artifacts and produces object file artifacts, or the linker, which consumes object file artifacts and then produces an application or shared library. Rules and cubes can have multiple output artifacts. Unlike GNU Make, although I believe there's some hacks you can use to a certain extent, it doesn't work very well. In cubes, this is a first class feature which doesn't require any special hacks or workarounds. And an example of how this is useful is a linker rule which produces both an executable and a debug information file like a PDB file on Windows or a debug symbol file on Mac OS. Another good example is the Java compiler, which produces a variable number of class files depending on the contents of the Java files themselves. You actually can't work, or you, you can't work it out based on the file names alone, and this is important for knowing the exact set of files to operate on in a subsequent build step, like uh, producing a jar file. The, the names and numbers of the files produced are actually an implementation detail of the Java compiler. So for example, you have to, have to actually run the compiler to know what it will generate in the first place. So you have to actually run it twice to track the output artifacts it will produce. Now, modules encapsulate a set of rules and input files to operate on. There's two kinds of modules in cubes, a regular module, which typically provides supporting infrastructure for a particular tool chain, operating system, or programming language, and product modules, which specify a concrete item that you want to create as part of your project. For example, an application, a library, or an MSI EXE installer, for example. You can introduce dependencies between modules using the depends item. For example, in order to build C++ source code, you would express a dependency on the CPP module, which activates all of the rules and properties necessary for compiling C++ source files into object files, linking object files into applications or shared libraries. And to build Java files or jar files, you'd similarly express a dependency on the Java module. And note that cubes, again, is not specific to any toolkit or programming language. There's no special handling for cubes I mean, there's no special handling for Qt, there's no special handling for C++, and all functionality is built from the same set of basic primitives. So this is in contrast to QMake, for example, where our Java support is basically a hack uh, layered on top of the C++ functionality. We override the compiler command with the Java compiler, we override the linker command with a command that produces a jar file, which isn't even really a linker in the first place. Dependencies are also used to express dependencies between concrete products. Uh, for example, that your application A must link to library B, and the depends item links them together in a way that will automatically add B's header path to A's library search path, and B's DLL output to A's linker command line. And the great thing about this is that it's very easy to write projects that don't care about the exact file system location of headers and libraries and other items, because Cubes figures it out automatically based on the properties that you specify in the export item of a particular module. Uh, last but not least, there's properties. Properties are defined by modules, and they can be applied to other module and turned to other modules as well as artifacts and products. 
These are used to control how a particular product is built, and you would use them to define the, the compiler and linker flags that are used, uh, whether to turn on pre-compiled headers, setting various product metadata like uh, copyright strings and version numbers and so on. If you're coming from QMake, Cube's properties are the rough equivalent of those name value pairs separated by equal signs in your uh, pro and pry files. So let's talk about how the Cube's primitives are tied together to create real world projects. In the last slide, we learned that there are concrete types of modules called products. We have a product here, which produces a simple hello world application written in C++. This is basically the close to the simplest uh, Cube's application that you can write. Now, I assume most of you have worked with QMake before and might have come across config plus equals ordered. This allows you to define the precise order in which a set of targets are built. Now, I wanted to mention this because it represents an important design difference between the two tools. Build order is, of course, important. You don't want your application to be built before your library because the application depends on the library, right? Otherwise, you'll get a linking error because the library doesn't exist. So in cubes, specifying build order is both impossible to express directly and it's also unnecessary because in cubes, we instead use dependencies to express the relationship between targets and allow the cube's engine to automatically determine what order they can be built in. This is important because it helps parallelize builds as much as possible, making them faster and more reliable. For example, if you have an application A, which depends on library B, there's no need to wait until B has been linked in order to start compiling A's object files. In fact, if A and B have roughly the same number of source files, it's likely that all the object files will be compiled first, and then B and subsequently A will be linked right at the end. Otherwise, if you had to wait for B to be linked to start processing any inputs in A, you'd be wasting CPU time since compiling source files in A has no dependency whatsoever on B's linker output. And internally, Cubes uses a directed acyclic graph to represent the tree of inputs and outputs. And on paper or on PowerPoint, that looks uh, something like this. So the build process of a product starts by examining the type property of the product that you can see there, which is a list of file tags, which are similar to MIME types, as I mentioned before. In our example, there's just one file tag, application. Uh, Cubes then searches through all of the rules available in the current context, meaning rules that are defined in the product or rules that have made, been made available via a module dependency, such as the compiler and linker rules that we've pulled in from the CPP dependency in the example here. So when Cubes finds a rule that produces one or more artifacts with the relevant file tag, it will look at the dependencies of that rule and then see that it depends on a rule producing artifacts tagged OBJ, and then find a rule producing OBJ artifacts that takes CPP artifacts as inputs. Now, the OBJ rule takes CPP artifacts as inputs. There's no rule in the current context that produces CPP files, but we do happen to have some input files in our project. And you see the main and class.cpp defined there. Now, when we added a dependency on the CPP module, that dependency, in addition to the rules that I just went through, also pulled in another cubes primitive called a file tagger. That file tagger looked at files matching the glob pattern star.cpp and then applied the CPP tag to those input files. Since these CPP, CPP files are raw input files, they by definition have no other dependencies, and now we can go back the opposite way through the tree, starting with the compiler rule we saw on the previous slide. And note that this design works very well for generated files. Those CPP artifacts could very well have come from another rule which produced them uh, by processing some other input, in either instead of or in addition to the raw files we listed in the project. And Cubes in general is very, very well suited to generating code as part of the build process. So back down the build tree, for each of the CPP files, the compiler rule will be invoked twice, uh, once for each file, producing a subject, separate object file for each one. Then the linker rule from two slides ago here will be invoked. Um, one thing to note, uh, there's a multiplex true property there. And this means that instead of producing one output per input and invoking the rule multiple times, it'll actually collect all of its inputs and invoke the rule only once to produce the final uh, application object. 
Now, you'll note that standard versus multiplex rules naturally map very well to compiler and linker processes. The compiler takes one input, produces one output. The linker takes multiple inputs and produces one output. Uh, finally, after the linker rule has been invoked, it produces an artifact tagged application. And since there's no other file tags that were in our product's type property, the build is done. So now that you got a basic idea of what the language looks like and how Cubes works, I want to talk a bit about the key features Cubes brings to the table that other build systems don't support or that are unique to Cubes in some way. So one of Cubes' core goals is independence of any particular programming language or toolkit. Cubes has excellent support for Qt, of course, which is built from the various primitives provided by the domain-specific language and is just another module that's no more specially handled by the internals than Java support, for example. And the same is true for its C++ support. There's absolutely no knowledge of C++ and the Cubes core engine. It's all handled by the modules, which are, of course, written in QML and JavaScript. So you know for sure that there's no dependency on the core because it's in different languages. Uh, the independence also extends to Cubes as a product, and this is very important. It's not developed as part of Qt itself, like QMake is. It has its own release cycle, it has its own version numbering. And we may even have a dedicated website for it in the future with documentation, examples, and tutorials, and so on. Cubes is just as independent from Qt as CMake is in terms of being a separate product. But it happens to be developed by the same people, meaning the Qt company, and uh, people in the Qt community, and it shares that philosophy of high quality and a fun and easy user experience. It could also be used for tasks traditionally outside the scope of a build tool. Uh, one of our contributors described Cubes generically as an artifact pipeline manager, which I thought was kind of interesting. Maybe graphic designers or visual artists could use it to apply operations on design content, for example. Uh, you could, say, convert PSDs to a series of PNG files and so on, and then you could deliver that to your development team to add into the final product. The next thing that is unique to Cubes is something you might not expect cross-platform support. So let's take CMake as an example. A lot of people get this wrong when they say it has cross-platform support. While CMake may be cross-platform in terms of compiling and linking C++ code, there are tons of other features that most traditional build systems don't even begin to touch. If you want to build for iOS with CMake, for example, well, there's actually no support for iOS. You have to supply your own toolchain file. You have to set a bunch of properties like the compiler path, library search paths, executable and shared library file extensions, and so on, which the build system should simply be able to know automatically when you tell it you want to target iOS. There are many projects all over the web that show how to create these toolchain files for CMake. And again, that you know contributes to that cargo called culture and copy and paste this and just hope it works. Uh, with cubes, you simply set the target OS property to iOS and you're done. It knows everything about Xcode and everything about iOS already. You don't need to tell it again. Next, there's support for bundles in the Apple ecosystem. This is actually more complicated than it seems because bundles in and of themselves are actually a single target. They're actually an atomic object. They're not just some directory hierarchy that you install into or, or a packaging and installation mechanism as other tools tend to treat them. Uh, there's also the fact that framework bundles can contain both debug and release binaries and Apple Mako binaries can contain multiple architectures. In cubes, we actually invented an entirely new engine primitive called product multiplexing to properly support these things, where other build systems employ hacks or workarounds that impose limitations on the structure of your project files. Product multiplexing works by transparently building your target multiple times with an optional aggregate pass that provides the ability to combine the artifacts from multiple passes into a single set of final artifacts. For example, if you want to build a 32 and 64-bit FAT binary with debug and release variants on macOS or iOS, the product will actually get built five times. Two architectures times two variants for four, plus the aggregate pass, five. Lastly, Cube supports 
many of and aims to support all of the native features of Xcode. You can build asset catalogs, nibs and storyboards, icon sets, and there's even in-development support for automatic code signing and provisioning directly within the build system. So you no longer have to kind of switch between QMake and Xcode and try to configure code signing manually, which is a big problem for a lot of developers. Apple's made it easier with recent versions of Xcode, but again, you still need to deal with two different build tools here, and it's still a lot to set up for uh, projects that are using Qt. Uh, similar, sorry. Similarly, for Android, until recently you needed to provide your own toolchain file with CMake, just like for iOS. Now the NDK provides an official one, but that's still not the complete picture. CMake's Android support extends only to building shared libraries with the NDK. You still need to learn and use a second build tool, Gradle, in order to build your actual APK, build AARs, compile your Java sources, uh, dex your class files, handle Android interface definition files, assets, resources, and use the manifest merger. Cubes does all of this directly. There's no second build tool to contend with on any platform. And as far as packaging, we support many packaging and installation tools. Uh, Wix, NSIS, Inno Setup for building Windows installers, uh, DMG installers with custom backgrounds and icons on Mac OS, uh, with many more on the way. Uh, the DMG installers is something I'm particularly proud of. Uh, there's some details about it in the Cubes 1.9 release post. Uh, unlike with CMake, we don't delegate any of this stuff to a separate build tool. Uh, in CMake, there's a I think it's called CPAC, which you can use to create packages. So in Cubes, we make it a, a first-class part of the build process for maximum flexibility and performance. So everything is integrated into one tool, into one process. All the way from source code to the final deliverable that you're shipping out to customers that you're putting on your web server for download. So as you can see, when we say Cubes is an all-in-one tool, we really mean all-in-one. All of these features are supported directly by Cubes, providing the very highest level of support integration and performance, instead of employing uh, a complex and limiting architecture like in the case of CMake or QMake, where this extra functionality is handled by the external generator and is subject to all the limitations thereof. Talking about platform support also wouldn't be complete without mentioning cross-compiling. Naturally, with out-of-the-box support for all major platforms, cross-compiling support is a core strength of Cubes. It's easy to build for multiple platforms on the same project, which is critical for projects like Qt, which need to build libraries for your target platform, uh, like an embedded Qnix device, and host tools like Mock and RCC for your host platform. Cubes also isn't limited to a traditional host plus target scheme like QMake, and instead host plus target are simply the consequence of a particular product's configuration. So you can have an unlimited number of target platforms in the same project, meaning things like Canadian cross builds or the Qt host plus target model are very easy to support without the tool actually having inherent knowledge of either of these models. And let me give you an example of where this is actually necessary. So if you're building a watchOS application, it must be embedded inside an iOS application bundle. And further, if you're using Qt, you're going to need host tools like Mock and RCC, which are necessary to generate code for both iOS and watchOS if you're using Qt code in both of those applications. So that's three platforms in one project. And it's actually impossible to support with QMake because it's inherently tied to that host plus target model I talked about, meaning that it cannot support two targets, iOS and watchOS, at the same time. And that's the key with cubes. Instead of your compiler, your target triple, and so on being global properties of the entire project, each target, or product as we call it in cubes, can have its own set of properties independent from the overall build. If a target isn't building C++ code, it might not even have a target triple assigned to it at all. Building a documentation product such as a Qt HTML help directory or QCH file involves no C++ related rules or concepts like a target triple or architecture because those rules and properties don't even exist in that product's context because it doesn't depend on that module. Now, in terms of IDE support, uh, this is an area where Cubes really shines and was one of the original inspirations for its creation. Uh, this is an area where it's being in the past extraordinarily difficult to integrate CMake into IDEs because parsing its language is difficult. Uh, server mode has helped with that somewhat, but with Cubes it was still a fundamental design goal and that makes it a lot easier. So we've done just that with Qt Creator and we allow 
the build tool and the IDE to remain very well informed of each other's actions and therefore provide a great user experience. One key point about this is that it allows the IDE to manipulate the project files directly via an API without having to understand anything about the cube's project file grammar. So it makes things like manipulating file lists and setting properties very easy. And it also provides great um, future opportunities for automatically generating user interfaces for project configuration based on metadata provided by the Cubes project via the API. So for example, uh, what properties are available and what modules and you know, providing checkboxes and dropdowns to select their values. So you know, imagine in a new screen in Cute Creator where you'd be able to do that, similar to the one where we have for CMake now. And it's kind of like Cute Designer uh, for widgets apps or the modern Cute Quick Designer, but for the build system. And you know, this is similar to the property pages in Visual Studio or the equivalent build settings UI in Xcode, and that's something we've never had before in the Qt ecosystem for our own build tooling. The Cubes API also allows for integration with IDEs in a less direct manner. Uh, Cubes provides a command line tool to invoke what are called generators, similar to CMake generators. Uh, the difference is that the projects generated by Cubes actually use Cubes itself to perform the build, at least by default, rather than relying on the build system of the native project file like MS Build in, X in uh, Visual Studio and Xcode Build in Xcode. And this ensures that your project files aren't limited and don't lose out on any functionality or performance while gaining the native IDE experience to the greatest extent possible. Generators are not only used to integrate with IDEs either. As one example, you can also use them to generate Clang compilation databases, which allow you to use Clang static analysis tools on your code base. You can also create your own generators using the Cubes API and perform arbitrary uh, processing on the build graph to uh, create whatever report or perform whatever analysis that you might like. And this type of introspection is something that's not typically available with most build tools. So that's a very unique capability to cubes. Uh, currently, our API doesn't have any binary or source compatibility guarantees. Um, so far, it's been relatively stable, but providing these guarantees is something we aim to look at in the future, but it's nothing we're guaranteeing at the moment. So don't publicly release any tools that rely on API or ABI stability. Dependency management is something that's central to every build system, but that is a lot more powerful in cubes. I want to stress that fine-grained and accurate dependency tracking is a major goal for this tool. We aim to completely eliminate the case where incremental builds get broken because some dependency relationship somewhere is underexpressed or not expressed at all, and also eliminates the case where touching an input file ends up rebuilding more than it needs to. Where cubes differs from other tools is the precision with which dependencies can be expressed. Unlike traditional make files, for example, where dependencies basically mean that file A depends on file B and that's about it, cubes provides a much higher level abstraction of what dependencies are. As I mentioned earlier, the depends item allows you to express a dependency on another module or product. Where it gets interesting is the ability to specify parameters to control exactly what that dependency means, a feature called dependency parameterization that was one of the major announcements in our uh, version 1.9 release. So let's say you want to link application A to library B. You specify a depends item in A with the name of B, and by default, Cube sees that one end of the dependency is an application, the other is a library, and it does the obvious thing, links them together. Now let's say B is a plugin instead. Because plugins are implemented as shared libraries on most platforms, except for uh, Apple platforms, you actually don't want to link to that plugin, but you want to express that the app depends on it, because obviously the plugin must be built in order, to the app, in order for the app to load it. So when you build and run your application, you want that plugin to be built and run as well. So to do this, you specify a dependency parameter called cpp.link, and you set that to false. And this tells Cubes to build the plugin B before the plugin A, but not to link to it. Um, in most cases, this is handled automatically because cubes can also be explicitly told that a particular library is to be built as a plugin, since plugins are not actually shared libraries on you know, all platforms like macOS. And this dependency parameterization can also be used to express uh, a bundle dependency, such as embedding a framework or a plugin bundle within your app bundle. 
uh, specifying that a library should be weakly linked, uh, and that means that it can be missing at runtime as a macOS feature, or specify that a static library should be linked using the whole archive flag, which means you want to link in all symbols. So the possibilities are endless uh, because you can define your own dependency parameters for your own modules, and this really goes to show how flexible the expression of dependencies in cubes is. And lastly, and for the sake of time, uh, I won't go into this too much, but a product can export a module to its dependees, uh, meaning that if I create a project file for my library, I can export its header search paths and the linker flags necessary to link to the library so that when your app depends on my library, all you need to do is specify that you depend on it. There's no need to specify any include paths, any library search paths, and so on. Cubes just automatically adds them to your target and everything is built. And no discussion of any build tool would be complete without talking about performance. And Cubes was, of course, designed from the ground up to win big in this area. And we still have a long way to go, and we're still going to enable a lot more optimizations. Now, of course, the more complete knowledge you have of the build graph, the more complex and interesting optimizations you can enable. And this is why it's important that Cubes has a full view of the entire project, compared to at least recursive make, which has only a view of the current directory in most setups. With cubes, you can build for min, uh, multiple independent configurations in parallel, which is useful because you can maximize the resource usage and parallelization of your host machine. If you have eight cores and you want to uh, build, say, three different configurations, you don't want to run make-j3 on all of those because you still have you know, nine overall uh, threads running in your build. So cubes will actually parallelize across all projects that you want to build for at the same time. Um, we actually did some benchmarks back in February of this year using Qt Creator as a test project. Uh, this compared QMake and CMake with and without Ninja versus Cubes. And unfortunately, they aren't complete enough where I'd want to release the full set of build files and numbers. And this isn't because we want to hide anything, but because we didn't yet fully audit all of the build files to ensure that they perform exactly the same tasks and produce exactly the same output. And we want to show a fair comparison. So I'll give you a brief overview, though, for the purposes of transparency on what we have so far. So full builds on Unix were fairly similar between CMake plus Make, CMake plus Ninja, and Cubes, with a difference of a few seconds each. Uh, QMake plus Make took a full two minutes longer, and that may be partly due to a missing feature to combine mock output. On Windows, full builds with Cubes were a full 30% faster than QMake plus JOM due to the way Cubes handles uh, file timestamps on Windows. Uh, for most build tools, it will read the um, modification timestamps of output files from the file system. In Cubes, we just cache those in the build graph. So uh, this means that the build directory is opaque. You're not supposed to manually change anything in it. You don't want to delete any files in the output directory. Just let Cubes handle it. If you want to perform a clean build, actually use the Cubes. Uh, I mean, if you want to clean output artifacts, actually use the Cubes clean command. Don't actually delete them manually because it will think that they're still there uh, because of that. Um, for a zero build, meaning no changes were made to any of the input files, uh, both CMake plus Ninja and Cubes were basically equivalent at under half a second each. Uh, the rest of the configurations varied mostly between 1.5 and 5 seconds with QMake plus Make uh, going as high as almost 7 seconds. And finally, incremental builds, the most important thing, in which our example only, C++, only one uh, C++ source file input was changed. Uh, this took only 2 seconds with cubes compared to roughly 7 to 11 seconds for all other configurations, even the ones that were using Ninja. Part of the difference here may be due to the CMake build uh, relinking too many outputs, and you know this is likely due to and demonstrates the advantage of Cubes' ABI-based linking optimizations. And note that in all of these numbers, the CMake-based build was found to install roughly 60 fewer files than the other build tools, so it might show a slight speed advantage as a result. And I hope that over the coming year or so, we can share more accurate and complete benchmarks with a full set of source code and uh, source code files and data so that you can audit these results for yourselves as well. So in conclusion, I hope that with everything you've heard here today that you agree that we can do much better than established build tools. Some of you have spoken of us reinventing the wheel, but sometimes innovation means taking something that others have already done and actually doing it right, like the iPhone did for smartphones. 
And remember, no one can make a difference by being like everyone else. Sometimes you have to think different and trust that it's time for a new approach. We want to make build engineering fun and easy. We want to achieve better performance for our builds and ensure that not only is our code well architected and maintainable, but our build scripts are as well. We want to be confident that our build tool produces the right output and that incremental builds are just as reliable as clean builds and lightning fast as well. We also want to have comprehensive and complete documentation so that we can actually understand what our build tool is capable of and how to use it to its maximum potential. CMake may have majority market share right now, but considering the audience, I think it's fitting to mention that so did Nokia back at the turn of the century until Apple came along and cut their value by an order of magnitude while at the same time increasing theirs a hundredfold. Perhaps market capitalization versus build tool popularity is uh, you know, not the best comparison, but it goes to show that technology can change quite quickly and drastically. Uh, and one more thing. Uh, the, cubes, the port of Qt to a cubes-based build system is currently in progress. If you're interested in checking out the work and maybe even lending a helping hand, you can find the patches on the WIP slash cubes2 branch of the Qt-based repository on Garrett. And thank you. We welcome your feedback. Um, we ended about 10 minutes early, so uh, now I'd like to take some questions if you have any. Questions. Can we use that already? Can you use cubes already? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, as you know, I have a, a, that question that uh, I need to make a, an app extension on my iOS app, and I really would like to, to give it a try. You already gave me the, the impression that that is possible. How do I start? So cubes has a lot of support for these Apple-specific things right now. Uh, there are still parts that are incomplete. I know one major thing that I still need to add support for is bundle embedding. So that's you know embedding frameworks inside your application bundle. Uh, but most of the base support is already there. So there's, there's some things that are missing. So you can't really build a complete iOS application nowadays, uh, especially not with Qt, because again, that depends on the bundle embedding feature. But there, a lot of the basic stuff is there already. So uh, I don't think we have that much further to go until you're able to build real world uh, iOS and Android applications because you know those are the um, most feature incomplete ports at the moment. Hi, uh, actually I've got two questions. Uh, first of all, is there any kind of importer from CMake or QMake based project files? And second one, uh, is there the ability, I hope so, uh, to have uh, conditional com com um, compile sub modules based on configuration? I mean, I want to build something based on a variable. Uh, so the first question was, is there an importer for QMake and CMake based projects? Um, yes and no. We have, a, we have a tool that we released recently called um, Cubes Create Project, and this will basically scan through a directory and it'll try to build a basic set of cubes files based on what files exist in that directory. It'll also look at the contents of existing QMake files in that directory and then try to guess a few things from it. So basically, it'll, it'll start to generate a project skeleton for you, but obviously you'll still have to do some manual work uh, to get it completely working. And uh, your second question uh, was, how do you do conditional compilation for modules? Uh, I mean, the general answer is because Cubes has a declarative language because it's based on QML and you can write arbitrary JavaScript on the right-hand side of property bindings. Conditional stuff is just very easy in general. So, uh, I mean, your, your question's kind of generic, so I'm not sure if I'm really giving you a complete answer, but in general, there shouldn't really be any problem with that sort of thing. It's, it's meant to be very, very easy and very configurable, very dynamic. Hello, uh, I would like to know if you support build, being called from an upper layer build system like uh, open embedded or Yocto and share the build server, the make job server to, for example, an upper stream, an upper layer build system could run end job in parallel and ded dedicate a few of them to cubes, for example. Um, not sure if I completely understood your question, but uh, you're asking about uh, parallel builds with cubes. Uh, by default, cubes simply builds with the number of cores, a uh, number of virtual cores available on your machine. So uh, 
quad-core processor with hyper-threading. It's roughly equivalent to Make-J8. So do you mean you, ten, you cannot restrict the oh, 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 level oh. of the parallelism? I, I'm sorry, yes. So you're asking if you can restrict the number of concurrent jobs that Cubes uses during a build. Uh, the answer is yes. It, it actually supports the dash J flag from Make. So you can do you know, uh, Cubes dash J4 to use only four threads or four jobs, just like you can with Make. Uh, hi. Um, my question is about uh, C++ modules technical specification. Is uh, there any kind of support as of right now? Because I know at least one build system uh, is having it, mm -hmm. or at least trying to, to test it. So how about Cubes? So the question was, um, does Cubes have any support for the C++ modules technical specification? Uh, you said at least one build system has support for it. I don't know if we're talking about the same one, uh, because Xcode build is one of those. Um, so the answer is no, we currently don't support C++ modules in cubes, but it's definitely something we're looking at because uh, if, it, well not if, but because Xcode supports that, it's something we inherently need to support anyways. Because if we add support for uh, Swift and there's also some other functionality in the Apple tools that, that kind of requires modules, then we basically need to add support for it because of that. So it's not implemented yet, but that's, uh, the, I think there's an existing issue to get it done at some point. Any more questions? Yeah. Um, so one of the big issues with C++, like forever, has been a package manager, and that doesn't actually exist currently. And uh, I quite like the dependency feature of QBS, so uh, of Cube, sorry. So uh, did you consider implementing a package manager, uh, like maybe uh, NPM or S or like Godot on top of Cubes? Uh, so the question was, have we considered adding or integrating a package manager with Cubes? Um, this is something that's very far out on the roadmap. Uh, we've talked a bit about things like this. Um, at least for me personally, I would like to see something like what Gradle has so that, and you know, Ozzy and I have talked about this a bit as well, uh, supporting different sources for the same module. So that means if you have a depends item on a particular product, uh, that product can either be taken from your internal build tree or it might uh, fetch the sources from a, remote, from a remote location and then build it as part of your project, or it might uh, find that dependency online and then download it and build it as part of your project. But very similar to what uh, Gradle does, you know, having multiple um, repositories from which it can get dependencies and then having those um, um, compile directives where you can specify the ID and version of a dependency and it'll just get it from wherever and just build it. So I'd, I'd like to see us do something similar with cubes, but uh, there's nothing like that that's implemented right now and nothing on the short-term roadmap, but it's, it's definitely something we want to look at. Uh, hi, uh, my question is about the maintainability of uh, big projects. So I uh, suppose the real-world projects usually have a lot of built variables and their custom rules. And I understand that those uh, will have to be implemented in JavaScript. And um, will it be easy to maintain project if they have a lot of JavaScript uh, here and there, and especially for C++ developers without uh, deep JavaScript knowledge? Um, I th so the question was, uh, will cubes be maintainable for large projects because you're going to have a lot of JavaScript in your build system? Uh, I think the answer to that is yes, um, and part of the reason is because you don't always have to embed JavaScript code within your cubes files. You can actually put JavaScript code in external JavaScript files, and then you can import that from a cubes module and call functions in uh, an external JavaScript file. So you can have, you know, like a nice little uh, library of cubes functions and then use those throughout your project. But, you know, in general, there's a lot of uh, ways that you can build reusable components in cubes because it's based on QML. So you can have, you can have, um, module or product item templates. So for example, in cubes, we have a few standard product templates like CPP application. And that's basically looks like product. It has a depends item on CPP and it sets type to application. So you can just say CPP application and then set your list of C++ source files and it builds a C++ application. You don't have to write all of that boilerplate every time because you can just get it from the base item. 
So maintainability and code reusability is, is a big thing in cubes. Is it possible to uh, define pre-built or post-built commands, I think, shell commands? <laughs> uh, is it possible to define pre-built and post-built commands? Um, technically, no, but you would just do it in a different way. Um, there, there's, depending on what you want to do, there could be issues. And generally, pre-build and post-build steps are a bad idea because they're not integrated with the dependency system. And in cubes, we want to make sure everything is handled by the dependency system. So basically, to achieve pre-build and post-build steps, you can do it, but it should be done in a different way that actually uses the dependency system so that you don't break incremental builds and things like that. I'm sorry? It's, I don't see why you couldn't eliminate make files. I mean, if you want to talk later about a specific example, we can. So uh, we are running out of time here and our sessions are really tied together. So I'm, I try to, we try to keep the time as a timeline here. So thank you for our presenters, Jake. And <laughs> thank you.